March Madness is the greatest sporting event of the year. And today in this video, we are going to recap day four, the second day of the round of 32. By the end of this video, our Sweet 16 will be set. Day three gave us the very rare occurrence of every single favorite winning. And with four double digit seeds playing today, I'm hoping we'll get some chaos. Game one, two seed Marquette versus 10 seed Colorado. Star point guard Tyler Kolick looks completely healthy after being out out for six games to finish the season and with him healthy the golden eagles are 24 and 6 on the season i told you guys yesterday that colorado is going to make this tough on marquette and they did just that they have three absolute dogs in kj simpson and tristan da silva who are late first round projected picks and freshman cody williams who is going as high as the top five in mock drafts he's also the younger brother of oklahoma city's jalen williams marquette would get out to an 11 point lead in the first half shooting an insane 68 percent from the field on 19 for 28 shooting but the buffaloes came roaring back in the second half taking the lead with 14 42 to go marquette's leading scorer cam jones would pick up his fourth foul with 7 46 to go in the game a nice take by jp simpson would make it a one point game with 238 to go after a couple empty possessions for each team tyler kolik would hit a clutch jumper with 54 seconds left making it 79 276 but cody williams would only go one for two from the line with 20 seconds to go and david joplin would make both of his free throws sending the golden eagles to the sweet 16 81 to 77 avenging their second round exit from last season punching their ticket to the sweet 16 for the first time since 2013. simply put tyler kolik is the best point guard in the country he played all 40 minutes in this game went 10 for 14 from the field 21 points 11 assists and five boards making kolik just the third player to have two games of 10 10 plus points, 10 plus assists, and 5 plus rebounds in the NCAA tournament since 1984. Colorado fails to reach the Sweet 16 for the first time since 1969, but I'm super excited to see Cody Williams in the NBA this upcoming season, and even someone like Tristan De Silva, who I think is going to carve out a role. This video is brought to you by StatHead. StatHead is your all access pass to the basketball reference database, and it's also a search engine that allows you to answer questions about basketball history in seconds. I personally use StatHead in almost every single video of mine, including this one. For example, let's say you're wondering who has the most points in a single game in March Madness history. With StatHead, you can find that answer almost immediately. You can put a variety of filters on your searches, giving you some pretty interesting records. They actually just added college stats and we'll have a couple more tools rolling out in the next couple of weeks that I'm really excited about. If you use code hardwood, you'll get $20 off an annual subscription. If you prefer monthly, they're offering a free trial for your first month using the link in the description. They also offer Offer some pretty cool discounts for students, military, and others. Check out StatHead today using the code hardwood or the link in the description. Game two, number one seed Purdue versus eight seed Utah State. The Aggies won their first tournament game since 2001 and are seeking their first Sweet 16 appearance since 1970. They would battle early in this one, being down only one point with six minutes to go in the half, but the Boilermakers would go on a 14 to zero run, finishing the half up 16. And from then it just wasn't a close game purdue dominates 106 to 67 Purdue's margin of victory of 39 points in the round of 32 according to stathead is the largest since the year 2000 Rewatching film from this game Edie just demands so much attention especially when he gets touches in the paint and utah state just didn't have anybody to put on him their best player great osabor was on him who's 6 8 and as you can see Edie is making him work every single possession and he's just so undersized Zach Eady would finish with 23 and 14 in just 27 minutes, going 8 for 11 from the field. Role player Trey Kaufman Wren was huge in this game as well, scoring 18 points. Eady also became just the first player since Lou Alcindor in 1968 to have 50 plus points. 35 plus rebounds and 65% from the field in their first two NCAA tournament games. And the Boilermakers continue their revenge tour. If you didn't watch the day two recap video, I mentioned that.
that Purdue lost to Fairleigh Dickinson, a 16 seed last season. Back in 2018, when Virginia became the first one seed to lose to a 16, they'd follow up the next season by winning the national championship. Could the Boilermakers somehow accomplish the same feat? Purdue is back in the Sweet 16. In 2022, they would get upset by St. Peter's, a 15 seed. And in 2019, they would advance to the Elite Eight on the back of Carson Edwards' legendary tourney run. But don't worry, we'll preview their Sweet 16 matchup in my Sweet 16 video coming out Tuesday. Game three of the day, four seed Duke versus 12 seed James Madison. Terrence Edwards, James Madison's best player and leading scorer, would pick up two fouls in the first couple minutes of this game, but I'm not sure it would have mattered that much. This one was all Duke, especially freshman guard Jared McCain, who finished with 30 points on 10 for 15 from the field, eight for 11 from three. He scored his 30th point with 11 minutes or so to go in the second half. And from there, it was a blowout. This was James Madison's first tournament appearance since 2013 and their first time winning a game in the round of 64 since 1983, but they failed to make the Sweet 16 for the first time in school history. Jared McCain's 30 points was just the second time a Duke freshman has scored 30 or more in the NCAA tournament, with Zion Williamson doing so against UCF in 2019. McCain also did not commit a turnover, making him the first freshman in the NCAA tournament since it expanded in 1985 to score 30 points and commit zero turnovers. Game four, three seed Baylor versus six seed Clemson. If you have told me that Clemson was going to be in the Sweet 16 before the tournament started, I would have laughed at you and potentially bankrupt myself betting against them. Not only did they defeat popular Sweet 16 pick New Mexico in the first round, but they led wire to wire in their defeat of the Baylor Bears, 72 to 64. Baylor was down by as much as 16 with six minutes to go before they would make their run, cutting it to just a two point game with 218 left on the clock. Star freshman wing Jacoby Walter, who was projected to go very high in the NBA draft went to the line down to 66 to 64 with 37 seconds left before missing both free throws the clemson tigers advanced to their first sweet 16 since 2018 and their fourth ever in program history this also marks the third straight season that baylor has been upset in the round of 32 as a three seed or better i understand they had that incredible run in 2021 winning a national title march madness is chaos these things happen with programs over a two to three year span but they got to get back to the Sweet 16 or the Elite Eight next year. They've just had far too much talent to continually be doing this over the past three years. We'll dive more into Clemson in the Sweet 16 video coming the middle of this week. Game five, 12 seed Grand Canyon versus four seed Alabama. I made it quite known that Tyon Grant Foster is one of my favorite players in this tournament, especially with his backstory I explained in day two, but this was the ugliest game of the tournament by far. Both teams were out of control, fouling a ton, and neither team could hit a shot. GCU shot 32% from the field and Alabama shot 37%. I was impressed by how GCU handled Alabama on defense. They really did stifle them. Alabama is almost never scoring 72 points in a game. They're one of the best offenses in the country, but Grand Canyon got to the free throw line 37 times and only made 20 three of them down 55 to 50 with seven minutes to go GCU would go on an 8-0 run powered by a tie on Grant Foster and one layup and then a Grant Foster jumper giving them a three-point lead but Alabama would punch right back going on a 7-0 run themselves extending the lead to four but it was the way they went on a 7-0 run that I have a huge problem with for Grand Canyon Mark Sears misses a three Alabama offensive rebound GCU fouls Alabama only makes one of two gets an offensive board misses a three gets an offensive board there's a foul on gcu they make one free throw offensive rebound and and one layup that's a five point possession right there late in a game that just absolutely cannot happen alabama wins this one 72 to 61 i have to give credit to the crimson tide i was pretty critical of them in my previous video and while i think the reasons i stated were valid they've made their second straight sweet 16 and they proved they can win games even when their shots aren't falling. Mark Sears was massive for them, finishing with 26, and they would finish with an insane 20 offensive rebounds. Grand Canyon also could get absolutely nothing going in their half-court offense. It was pretty ridiculous, actually. Their execution was awful. They were pretty much only scoring in transition or Grant Foster in isolation. 
And as much as I wanted to believe in GCU, it never felt like they were going to win this game. They did win their first ever NCAA tournament game in program history this season, so they have a lot to build on for the future. Game six, number one overall seed UConn versus Northwestern. Not much to say here. UConn absolutely dominated, especially in that first half, outscoring the Wildcats 40 to 18. And although Northwestern would outscore the Huskies in the second half 40 to 35, it's just way too little too late against the best team in the tournament. UConn shot 54% from the field, but only 13% from three, going three for 22 which is super uncharacteristic of them. Boo Booey struggled in this game going two for 15 from the field with only nine points, finishing a storied career for Northwestern, bringing them to their only two NCAA tournaments in school history. Also, I want to say I want zero part of playing UConn in this tournament. They are terrifying. And Dan Hurley had this to say about the committee. He's pissed off. I think that the, you know, the committee, you know, has tried to make this as difficult as they can on us. You know, we know what they had in mind and it just, uh, you know, it's more fuel on the fire. Game seven of the day was my favorite but it didn't get that interesting until the end nine seed texas a&m versus number one seed houston these schools are only about 90 minutes away from each other houston has the best defense in the country but i predicted in my last video texas a&m was going to make it tough on them the aggie star wade taylor would have a very rough shooting night going five for 26 in the game but down 81 to 71 with 148 left on the clock buzz williams elected to play the foul game and it worked to a t houston would miss two of their first four free throws and turn the ball over, putting it to a five-point game with 112 left on the clock. LJ Cryer would then foul Wade Taylor on a three, fouling him out. Emmanuel Sharp would miss one of two free throws, and Texas A&M would get a layup, cutting it to three points. At this point, they could play straight up, just needing to get one stop, and they would do so after Jamal Shedd gets blocked on this jumper. There's a crazy sequence to end the game with multiple offensive rebounds, and with a second left, Anderson Garcia Garcia would hit a three as time expired sending this game to overtime he's only attempted 23s on the year making his ninth it was an incredible moment. Houston guard Emmanuel Sharp would have a career high 30 points in this game on the back of seven threes, but he would foul out to begin overtime, joining LJ Cryer on the bench and leaving Jamal Shedd to will his team to a victory in overtime. Shedd would do just that with this incredible layup to go up four with 30 seconds left. He would play every minute of the game until fouling out himself with 18 seconds left. Wade Taylor makes both free throws, cutting it to three. And then Texas A&M fouls walk-on Ryan Elvin, who was put in the game because Houston had four starters fouled out. Elvin has played a combined 173 minutes in his four-year Houston career, and somehow he finds himself in the game going to the free throw line with everything to lose. Naturally, he misses the first shot long, but recovers and makes the second one, sealing this victory for Houston in an absolutely gutsy performance from both teams. According to ESPN, this is just the fifth time and the second in the modern era that four players have fouled out and a team has won a game in NCAA tournament history. AM would shoot 45 free throws in this game, which is the most in an NCAA tournament game since 2022, and this happened just seven times since 2000, yet they would only make 29 of those free throws. They also had 26 offense rebounds in this game, the most since 2018 when Michigan State also had 26. And as much credit as I give to Texas A&M for lengthening this game and going from being down 11 with 90 seconds to go to overtime, you also have to give a ton of credit to the Houston Cougars for keeping their composure and finishing this game in overtime so many teams would have folded all of the momentum was against them they had four starters fouled out just an incredibly gutsy performance and probably my favorite game on this slate today game eight the final game of the second round 13 seed Yale versus five seed San Diego State. This game was disgusting. Yale got absolutely destroyed. Credit SDSU, they have the ninth best defense in the NCAA, according to Ken Palm, and they held Yale to 21 points in the first half. Jaden Ledee was massive for them again, scoring 26 points, having nine boards on nine for 12 from the field. But yeah, I don't have much to say about this game besides that. And that concludes our second round of March Madness, day four recap. 12 of the top 16 seeds advanced to the 
the Sweet 16 this year, giving us our seventh lowest seed total in NCAA tournament history. But boy, oh boy, are there some fun matchups in the Sweet 16 that I will be covering in my Sweet 16 video coming out in a day or two. I really hope you enjoyed this series. If you missed the first three days, you can check out those videos here. I would love any comments on how you'd like to make these videos better. We also do NBA videos on the channel, but I've been having a blast making these March Madness videos for you guys. I hope you enjoy, and as always, we'll see you on the hardwood.